Um, but, you know, when we're thinking about today, I was sharing with prayer as like, I really wanted to talk more about the election today, but I just felt like the Holy Spirit kept grabbing the back of my head and like pushing it into a certain passage. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. We'll see how we can make this work. Um, but then when we talked, when Bruce and I were talking about praying, then it all kind of fell in together how this works, because this passage does tie in with, with how we are going to need to be in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this passage has been so heavy on my heart for the last couple months. And the reason why is because I like to go on vacation with things. Um, and I say that to mean like I am a repetitive person. I will do things over and over and over again. So if I listen to a song, it's probably a nine minute long repetitive song, right? And I'm listening to that song nonstop over and over and over again. I can eat the same sandwich for lunch every day for the rest of my life and be just fine, right? I like watching the same movies. I like watching the same TV. I like to go on vacation with things. My wife is very different. <laughs> she likes variety, right? It's like, hey, we should go eat so-and-so place. She's like, we had that like a year ago. I'm like, well, what? Like we, that was a year ago. I could eat that place every day, right? So it's the same thing with songs where I'm like, hey, you know, we're not listening to the radio. Why don't you put this song on? And she's like, which one of your three songs are we listening to right now, right? Because I just cycle through them. But I love to chew on songs, right? I love to just kind of like pick them apart, think about them. And obviously, we're talking about Christian songs here, right? We're talking about worship songs. And um, the song that's been stuck in my craw recently is a song. It's called Wouldn't It Be Like You by Brian and Katie Torwalt. If you want to write it down, you know, if you're, if you're taking my recommendation for music, you're welcome to write that down. If you don't trust my recommendation, don't feel like you have to write it down. Uh, but it's called Wouldn't It Be Like You by Brian and Katie Torwalt. I just want to read to you the first verse and the first chorus, and maybe it'll help explain why it's been stuck inside of me so much. <sighs> Thought I had you figured out, so sure I knew exactly how you'd move. Thought my Savior was coming with a sword in his hand. To my surprise, he came as a child. And wouldn't it be like you to be different than we thought, different than we want, but better? You're better. You know, as I'm watching, my wife and I, we were watching The Chosen, and, and I love watching those kind of things because it helps color in gaps and put in context, things that when you're reading, you don't necessarily think about. Like the fact that Rome is literally on every street corner. This is a nation inside their borders, right? A, a, an outside group. They were expecting a military political savior. That's what they were expecting Jesus to do. And what did they get? They got a humble God. Whew, right? So I'm like listening to the song over and over and over again. And I'm walking down the stairs and it's like, wouldn't it be like you to be different than we thought, different than we want, but better, you're better. And it like hits me in the side. Like I remember just feeling it. And I'm like, I stop in my tracks. And I'm like, how can you be better than we could have ever imagined? How is that? Like, I can understand that you're all powerful. I get it. That makes sense. I can understand that you're big and I'm little. Makes sense. I like that. I like that arrangement. How are you also humble? Like, God, it's too much. <laughs> it's too much for me to comprehend. I'm not saying I don't believe it's true, but I can't reconcile how that can be true. How could you be humble? So then what, is, what I believe happens with good worship songs is you're pushed back to the word. So I'm pushed back to Philippians 2, 5 through 11, talking about the mindset of Christ Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is the humility of Christ. Because it's something that's hard to wrap your head around. So if you would, would you go ahead and turn over to Philippians 2? Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite passages. Now, I do have to apologize. I, I think <laughs> I've memorized this passage like three or four times. But unfortunately, it's different points of my life, so they're different translations. <laughs> so I may at some point go off, and I'm probably going to, like, smorgasbord three or different translations together. So I apologize in advance. Um, but I, one thing I like about having it in my heart and different translations is it helps give a little bit more context. Because, unfortunately, the words don't always go exactly with translation. Um, so it helps color it out a little bit. So if I do flub it up a little bit, I'm just, you know, giving myself an excuse. There you go. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And we're reading this one out of the New King James today. 
We're going to start in five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the example that you have given us. God, we are so thankful that you came down to be with us, to rub elbows with us, even as we're saying it, even as I'm saying it right now, Lord, it doesn't quite compute how you could be that good. So I just pray today, as we're going through this, as we're going through this passage, would you open up a new part of our heart, a new part of revelation? Would it, would it hit in such a way? We can all have the head knowledge of knowing what you did for us, knowing the sacrifice you gave, but would there be a deeper heart knowledge, Lord? Would there be a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation for how good you truly are? And would that be our example too, Lord, the humility, the mind of Christ. We also pray, Lord, while we're here, (laughs) we also pray for our mission team. We thank you so much uh, for the guidance and support, Lord, that you've already given them. Uh, We know it's been a little rocky as far as transportation issues, but we know that you're even in the midst of that, Lord. And we know that you are ordaining the right times and the right places. And so we pray for this last week. We pray for a boost of energy, a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, that you would just already uh, start to work on people's hearts before they're even going to knock on the doors, Lord, that their, their hearts would be changed, God, and that their hearts would be open. And, and we pray for safe travel back. We pray for much rest. We're so excited to see our, our family back and to hear the great stories of what you have done, Lord. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Um, can I get my water? Like I said, it's a byproduct of good worship. Now my voice is going. Goodness gracious. Um, humility. Just in general, I, I find humility, I, I don't know if you guys disagree or whatever, but I find humility to be one of the most attractive traits that you can find in a person, right? Whether it's your, uh, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a family member, whether it's someone you're working with, someone that works for you. No one likes to work with arrogant people, right? Or on the flip side, maybe they're not arrogant, but they're so hard on themselves. They're always being such downers. Like humility is such a, a, it's a trait that stands out, especially when you're around someone who we would say has power, right? Maybe you're around a wealthy person. You're around someone with fame, you know, someone with influence with, uh, you know, local municipalities or whatever. When you find those kind of people that have humility, guess what? You tell people about it. Because it's not common, (laughs) right? It's like, yeah, I met so-and-so, and and they weren't like a colossal jerk. (laughs) They were humble. It's something that stands out. Now, imagine that, but with God. The most power, all the riches, everything that could ever happen, and that person is still humble. That's who we're talking about today. So in Philippians 2, you know, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. He's writing it from prison. And in chapter 1, it has all the normal, you know, openings of a Pauline letter. And one of my favorite verses is uh, 121, is in chapter 1, for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And Paul says, but it's better for you that I stay around, so I hope for that, right? So we start, we start in earnest. Let's go ahead and start in Philippians 2. And uh, in verse 2, Paul asks them to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. And the complete Jewish Bible, he says, complete my joy by having a common purpose and uh, and a common love by being one in heart and mind. Paul's calling for unity, right? And and what I find interesting for me personally, my, my deepest relationships in my life, whether it be my wife, my family, um, you know, different friendships, they all have one thing in common. They're with believers, You want to know why? Because there is a deep unity that we have with one another because we have the living Holy Spirit on the inside of us. That is the deepest soul tie you could ever have. So if you are struggling to have those tight connections, I'm going to, you know, a little bit of it is on you. It's plugging in. It's finding people because it is so easy to connect with people when there's the Holy Spirit inside. I even met somebody the other day 
And we just started talking. We struck up a conversation. We exchanged numbers because it was a fellow Christian. Didn't know them, never knew them before. And like we're talking and it's like, kind of feels like God's here right now, doesn't it? (laughs) Right? Just a friendship out of nowhere because the Holy Spirit is the tightest bind. That is the unity that is brought. He goes into verse 3 talking about selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each other, let each esteem others better than himself. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's talking to the church right now, right? We think about selfish ambition or vain conceit, and you may think about America, right? Because in America, everything has to get bitter, bigger, better every year, right? Every company has to make more money. I want to make more money. I want to get a better car. I want to get better houses. Like, I want to have the ambition. My career better grow, right? But he's specifically talking to the church right here. Selfish ambition within the church. One of my favorite songs growing up uh, was from a uh, Christian rapper named Lecrae. Don't know if you guys have heard of him. Um, I can rap most of his songs. I'm not going to do it right now, but I could if I wanted to. Okay, just, just so you know that. Um, one of my favorite songs was Chase That, which is also in parentheses called Ambition. And the song talks about how he grew up wanting to get glory from playing basketball. So he would set all these goals, and he would reach them, and then he would still feel empty. Then he set up his goals were to be the best rapper, right? And he would reach those things, and guess what? He was still felt empty. One of the lines is talking about Alexander the Great, the same way that he felt when the world ran out of room. There's a doom that we feel because we can never fill that ambition that we have, right? One of my favorite, ver- one of my favorite verses, one of the favorite uh, lines that he says is, I'll tell you what's worse is chasing your own glory by doing the Lord's work. Whoa. That hurts, right? And that was something for me. Like, I knew I wanted to be in ministry, and I would listen to that, and I'd listen to the song over and over again, And because I like to go on vacation, right? (laughs) I listened to the song over and over again, and that kind of stuff would just hit me. It's like, Lord, I never want my ambition to be against your glory, Right? But that's something that you have to be aware of. That's something that we need to fear. And Paul is bringing it up because it's something that happens, right? It's not, he's not bringing it up for no reason. So then what's the example of what to do is to have lowliness of mind, which means humility. So what example do we have for that? He brings in Christ. So don't have selfish ambition. Don't have vain conceit. Think of others better than yourself. Have a lowliness of mind. Be humble. How should we be humble, Paul? Be humble like Christ. So in steps Christ's example. This is 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Question for you. Is this mind in you? (laughs) What does that mean? It's a desire to think like Jesus thinks. Do you have a desire to think like Jesus thinks? And because I think it's important that we desire that. It's not something that's just going to happen. It's something that we have to push for. It's something that we have to look for. And guess what? You're going to have victories. I think sometimes as Christians, we like to share our struggles <laughs> a lot. But it, share your victories, too. It, this happened a couple months ago at, at men's night. And we were sitting at a table, and there was four of us uh, dads. And we were sharing victories that we had. And it was kind of funny because each one of us had a story about how we had had a breakthrough with one of our kids And kind of like, we're like, it doesn't really make sense because now I'm kind of seeing them with the eyes of Christ. I feel like I'm seeing them like the Holy Spirit sees them. Like the the behavior that didn't make sense before, it's like God downloaded how I'm supposed to act and and it worked. And we're like high-fiving each other. Like, this is awesome, man. This is great. Now, guess what? I probably didn't have the mind of Christ when I was driving home that night and someone was on my bumper, right? (laughs) Feels like sometimes it comes and fits and starts. But there is going to be victories, You're going to see growth in the mind of Christ Jesus when you have a desire to have that mind. Uh, Randy was talking about this recently, that we should be transformed. We have to continue to be transformed. Not conform to the world, but continue to be transformed. I wish transformation was like the Hulk, right? Where I could just be like, and now I'm humble, right? And just like start popping my shirt with all the humble muscles or whatever, right? I wish it's something I could put on. I wish I could just like put on a jacket and be like, guess what, guys? Now I'm humble. But that's not exactly how it works. It takes a desire. It takes spending intimate time with the Holy Spirit to get to know who Jesus was, to get to see like his eyes. It's praying, Lord, give me your eyes to see people the way that you saw them. Right? 
if we, uh, if we go into verse 6, and it talks about, who, he says, he, he who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God. This is very important. Jesus was already God. Okay? If you didn't know that, he was. He was already God. He wasn't created in the manger. He was revealed to us in human form in the manger. Now, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, you can do some research. I don't want to get too off in the weeds here, but you can see Jesus in the Old Testament. If you type in angel of the Lord, there's different examples of the physical representation of God. And many believe that's Jesus. I believe that's Jesus. But he was already equal. The important thing is here is that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they already existed. They weren't created out of thin cloth or, or out of just thin air, right? They already existed. They were already equal. It was nothing to be grasped. So he gave up his status of that as God. But important to note here, he did not empty the godness out of him. He became both fully God and fully man. This goes into verse 7. He made himself of no reputation. Some translations will say he emptied himself, but it's talking about his reputation. It's talking about the verse above. He was still fully God and fully man. So I love this, you know, translation. It doesn't get hung up there. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. This is, this is where it comes back to, God, how are you this good? This isn't how I would have designed to do it. If I were to tell you a story about a God who came down to be with men, don't you think he would make himself the biggest, the richest, the most powerful? He'd be flexing all the time. But what did he do? He came as a baby into a small town, a small poor town. He was born into a family of scandal. We know that Mary, you know, got pregnant due, due to the immaculate conception, but her town didn't know that, right? They probably didn't believe her. <laughs> it was a family of scandal. He came to a despised people, the Jewish people, pretty much for all eternity, or for, you know, from the beginning of time, even in this time, were a despised people. They were looked down on. And guess what? Life in general just sometimes stinks, right? He experienced everything from a stub toe to death. His death, but also death of those that he loves. He experienced and mourned death. He put himself through that. And through all of this, he was still God. In verse 8, it talks about being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Whew. Let me read that again. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So we're we're going to sit here for a second. This is the part that's too much for me sometimes. I can't, I can't get over this. Even death on the cross. This is the most shameful death. The Roman citizens weren't even allowed to be executed this way. It was a shameful, it was a disgusting death. But this shows us that there is no limit to God's love for us. Even death on a cross. How far would he go? He would do even the most extreme thing to show his love for us. What else does it say? He humbled himself. He was in control here. This was action. This didn't happen to him. You know, what happened in the Old Testament when you had to make a sacrifice? You would choose the perfect lamb. You would pull them out, the spotless lamb, and you would bring them. They were brought to the slaughter. Jesus walked to the slaughter. He humbled himself. He chose himself. He self-identified, even with the you know, Garden of Gethsemane. If it's your will, God, he gave himself up to it. He had action. He had agency in this. He chose every step of the way to do this, to continue to humble himself. You know, I uh, talked to the men here really quick. Not that, uh, not that women, that you don't have these same feelings, but I just, I've never been a woman, so I don't, I don't know if you've had these feelings. At least not yet. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, sorry, that was bad. Um, but, uh, by the way, go vote. Um, so, you know, side thing. Uh, but as a man, as a man, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Back on track. As a man, I can say that I love my family um, with like a deep, deep protection love where when it, I remember when I first met my son, when he was first born, and I'm looking into those big blue eyes. And it's like a second before I didn't know him. And now I'm looking into his eyes. And I'm like, I would kill for this kid. I would die for this kid. Like it was immediate, right? And it's like, I remember the first time they're sick and they have a fever. And it's like, 
God, if, if I killed myself, like, would they be okay? <laughs> you know, it's like, you go to weird places because it's like, I would do anything to protect this child. This is my son. I want to protect him, right? Uh, on the same, you know, talking about elections, don't mess with my kids, right? In the same breath. There's nothing more that you can get to anger me than you mess with my kids. You're going to see an unholy man if you mess with my children, right? That's separate, but you know, you know what I'm saying. So in the same way, this is how God views you. There's nothing that would stop him from protecting his children. There's nothing that would stop him from giving you the opportunity to be with him forever. That's why he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He took the form of a man to give us the example. So then what happens in verse 9? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus. Jesus. The name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ's humility brought an understanding to us. The word became flesh. You think about it. What was revealed to us? So remember, God was all three persons for all eternity. But what was revealed to us in the Old Testament? We had God the Father. And then Jesus comes down, reveals himself. The word became flesh. He rubs elbows with us. We can see more of God's character, how he walks things out. And then what happens when Jesus ascends? He sends the comforter. Now you have God on the inside of you. So when you're reading things and they don't make sense, this is what's beautiful. I can sing the song over and over again. It doesn't make sense. I come back to the word. It doesn't make sense. Where do I go? I go to the Holy Spirit. Can you make this make sense? Because I have God living on the inside of me. And none of this happens without the humility of Christ to come down and reveal himself to us. We know now his character. We know his suffering. He's displayed something for us to chase after. Now we have the perfect example of who Christ is, who we should be. That at his name, every knee should bow, every tongue could confess. There is no higher name. Can you just say that right now? Can you just say Jesus right now? Just say Jesus. Is there something in your life right now that you need to speak Jesus over? Would you just put it in your head? Would you put it in your heart? Is there something that's, that, you know, you're not winning at? Something maybe that's getting kicked in your face? Can we just say Jesus over that? Jesus. Come on, just speak it over it. The most powerful name that there is, that at every knee, every tongue, Lord, we just give you that name. I speak it over our situations, Father. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, you know, it shows Christ's humility. And here's the thing is that we live in a culture that likes to label Jesus as what? A good teacher, right? Kind of a wacko. Like he was a, he was a good dude. He, you know, he loved people. He was kind of this hippie. He was a weak hippie, you know, make love, not war, whatever. Remember who he was based off of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He was God. Have the mindset of Christ Jesus. He was God who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself, made himself nothing, took on the form of a man, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And now, that it doesn't just stop there. Now his name is higher than any other name. God has exalted his name higher than any other name. All of this happens. This is the God that we serve. This is the Jesus that we serve. Because of the humility that he had, we now have the ability to understand and to know him. Otherwise, there still would have been separation. I mean, I don't know. It probably we'd still be dealing with temples and priests and a disconnection and prophets. But now we are able to have the Holy Spirit inside of us walking around with us because of what God did. How good is our God, Right? At this point, I want to go ahead and get the worship team um, to go ahead and start coming on up. There's a couple of things. We want to turn it inward just, just really quick here at the end to talk about the humility. Because part of the humility is an example of who we are supposed to be. No pressure, right? Be humble as Christ is humble. Have the mindset of Christ Jesus. Hey, Paul, what's the standard? Be like Christ. Okay, sounds good, right? Is there a lower bar we could start with, Paul? Would that be okay? <laughs> have, what are we supposed to do? Have the mindset of Christ Jesus. Chase after, follow after God. So, I believe that humility comes from confidence. It comes from confidence. It, it's, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Right? 
I didn't make that up, so I'll say it again because it's kind of a tongue twister, right? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's having the confidence not to be worried so much about yourself. And guess what? You can think about yourself less when you know whose you are. When you know where your identity is, I'm looking at you, Jake. When you know, we talk, uh, the reason why is Jake and I talk about identity all the time. When you know whose you are, you can think of yourself less. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I used to, in a prior life, uh, I would traveled around the country doing um, youth events uh, on Thursday. We would set up on Thursday. We'd do them on Friday and Saturday night. These were Christian youth events. And then on Sundays, we would go to the host church. And so we were very tired. We had worked for like 40 hours straight. I've been in many churches all over the country. Um, And I hate to report that I don't remember a lot of it (laughs) because I was probably sleeping at most of them. I was was 20, cut me a little bit of slack, right? But I remember this one point that stood out and it stood out to me to this day. This was like 12 years ago. I can't tell you the church I can't tell you the name of the church. I can't tell you the name of the pastor, but I can tell you this story because it, it hits so much. It hits so deep with me with identity. So, and I don't remember the pastor's name. So I'm going to substitute my last name when, when he's going to use his last name at some point. So he's talking about his son. When he was younger, he was 10 to 12 years old and he was getting bullied, ruthlessly bullied. Um, and it was really starting to affect the kid. Um, it was really, he was losing all of his confidence. Um, he was having trouble now at school, having trouble at home, not necessarily acting out, but just, they were really getting concerned. Um, they thought they were losing their boy. And they, they did all the work they could. They worked with the school. They worked with the parents. They tried to alleviate it. They tried to do the, mitig- the mitigation, but he was still getting bullied. And so the pastor said, at one point, he grabbed his son by the collars and picked him up looked at him eye to eye and he said you are a jones there is nothing that anybody could ever say to you could ever do to you could ever treat you could ever cuss at you could ever punch you there's nothing anybody could ever do to make you not a jones and i'll go even further you could wa- you could run away from this family You could try to divorce yourself from this family. You could try to change your name and it would not change the fact that you are my son. That little imprint of identity was all that he needed. He got the confidence to go back and stand up. There wasn't a fight, but he just didn't let the bully bother him anymore. Kids, that's that's a little free nugget for you. Most of the time, if you just ignore the bullies, they'll ignore you. They're more insecure than you are. So... But I believe that we serve a God that does that to us. That when you are looking for your identity, when you need to know whose you are, he grabs you by the scruff of your neck. He pulls you up. He looks you in the eye. He said, you are my son. You are my daughter. There's an enemy who accuses you. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they bring up. I don't care about your past. Because when I see you, when I look at you, I see my son. I see the blood of Christ. That's who I see. And guess what? I'm going to go further. There's nothing that you can do to undo what I have done for you. There's nothing that you can do to undo the sacrifice that I have made. God is looking you in the eyes. And when you can put yourself in that position to hear whose you are, then guess what? Humility just comes. It's not perfect. I wish I could tell you I'm the most humble person, but if I told you, then it wouldn't be true, right? But it's something that we need to chase after. I think it's very important. Let's talk about the election. (laughs) I think it's important for me to say this. I am a big believer that Christians have the right, privilege, obligation to fight. I believe it. Locally, at the state level, federally, vote. Vote, vote, vote. I've already voted, okay? And like I told you before, you you mess with my kids, you get Papa Bear, like unholy stuff, right? (laughs) But... Let's not even say but, let's say and. How about that? Because it's not in opposition to, it's also. And have the attitude of Christ Jesus. Have the mind of Christ Jesus. I I hate to break it to you, we're probably not gonna know the results on Tuesday (laughs) or Wednesday or Thursday. Lord, Lord knows, it takes a while, right? Let's have a humility Wednesday, okay? That doesn't mean we're walked over. That doesn't mean you can't have conversations. I actually, I feel like the Lord has challenged me to speak up more, but with the mind of Christ. I had it this last week where I got it in, into it with some people. 
And the whole time I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, you're okay here, but don't get angry. Don't get mad. And as I walked away, he's like, I want you to be done being mad at sinners. (laughs) Why are you wasting your time being mad at sinners? And then, God, would you break my heart for those who don't know you? Because guess what? There's people on both sides who don't know him. So regardless of political party, would you guys go ahead and stand? We're gonna, we're gonna end in prayer. We're gonna go into a little bit of worship here. And so regardless of political party, Lord, we trust, we, first of all, we give you our nation, Lord. Like we prayed about it before. We, we trust that you have your hands in all of this. You already know what happens Tuesday when the results come in. You're the Lord over that, Lord. Even if we don't trust it, Lord, you are the Lord over our nation. But I pray right now, that we would have the mindset of Christ Jesus. Lord, that we would be okay to stand up, to fight, especially for our kids, especially for our community. But would you give us the heart and the mind of Christ Jesus? Would we not get into fist fights with sinners? <laughs> would we have the humility on Wednesday to be able to talk, to be able to disagree, but with your heart, with your mind? I'm not praying for weak Christians to be mulled over. We know we don't serve a weak God. Jesus didn't come down and was weak. He just turned it upside down. And we believe that. So I pray, would you turn those things upside down in our heart? Would you give us a fervor to fight? Would we also know whose we are? Lord, would that be something we meditate on this week? I pray for anybody here who is struggling with identity who is hearing, I feel like the Lord's saying, there's people here who are holding themselves back from fully experiencing the goodness of God because you are hearing about your past. You are hearing about who the accuser labels you. And I just wanna remind you right now that God doesn't see your past. (laughs) He sees the blood of the lamb. He sees his son when he looks at you. You're not perfect yet. Perfection is coming, but you are perfect made new and you have the blood covering your life so just if that's you today would you just release that would you allow the holy spirit would you allow god to pick you up by the collar to look you in the eye and say you are my son you are my daughter and there is nothing that anybody could ever say there's nothing that anybody could ever do there's nothing that you could ever do to undo what i have done for you feel that, hear that, take it. So Lord, we give you this day, we give you this week, we give you our country. We trust you, God. In Jesus' name.